Well, hello from Beijing and welcome to today's special edition of Greenfront on COP15 Biodiversity. I'm Kay Kui from CGTN. While negotiators in Montreal have finalized an agreement to halt and reverse the destruction of nature by 2030, well, as the COP15 United Nations Biodiversity Conference concluded in Montreal, Canada, with China holding the rotating presidency of the Conference of Parties to the CBD. While well, an announcement issued yesterday says the gathering nations at the Biodiversity Summit have agreed to four goals and 23 targets in total. While well, these goals include protecting 30% of the world's land, water, and marine areas by 2030, as well as the mobilization by 2030 of at least 200 billion US dollars annually in domestic and internationally biodiversity related fundings from all sources including private and public. So we are now approaching the end of 2022 with a very fruitful COP27 in Egypt and also uh, COP15 in Montreal, Canada. Definitely we have a lot to reflect on in this past year of climate change commitments. Our fate is definitely inextricably linked uh, to the nature. So today we are very honored to have three guests joining us um, to discuss this very specific and very important issue, biodiversity. And these three guests are uh, Tian Yu Zhang, Executive Dean of the Belt and Road Green Development International Research Institute, um, and also Zhou Fang, Vice President and the Secretary General of the Film and Television Branch of China Pacific Society. She is also the Chief Director of Underwater China, and also Zhang Huadong, Associate Professor and doctoral supervisor from the School of Agriculture um, of China Agriculture University. Um, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, very nice to have you today with us. Let me start from Jianyu first. Uh, Jianyu, I know that you went to Egypt, but you didn't go to Montreal this time. So what is your um, comment on the general outcome of this year's COP15? Are you satisfied with the results? Yeah, uh, I, I think I, I was very excited uh, you know, watching the uh, final gravel uh, from Mr. Huang announcing the uh, success of the, uh, the COP15. And right. uh, you know, originally, I don't think people have uh, that much actually an expectation uh, of the extent of the depths and the details that uh, were ruled out uh, from the final outcome of the agreement, particularly the, uh, the four uh, goals that uh, you mentioned very impressively uh, with a uh, uh, monetary figure that's attached, because we know, you know, from our our very uh, dear experience of the uh, climate negotiation process, that uh, you know, without the money, without the financial commitments, uh, right. lots of these targets are just going to be in in the air, and uh, without uh, uh, you know the, uh, the 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 reality of the implementation. Right. Um, you know, I heard the talk um, for, you know, this time COP15 uh, conference is not, was not smooth at all. Um, and, you know, once um, all the delegates members almost walked out from the conference, but finally, as you mentioned, that we achieved the result. Um, so can you, you know, give us a little bit more detail uh, because you are one of the participants. Uh, you mean COP15 or COP27? COP15, <laughs> COP15. <laughs> yeah, you know, because the two COPs are so close to each other. Well, again, right. on the on the COP15, I think the goal of 30 by 30, as you mentioned, is very something yeah. very significant and very aspiring. And uh, also uh, the removal of the subsidies uh, by 2030 of uh, you know 500 billion dollars uh, uh, that was wrongfully uh, subsidizing the uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 devastation of the biodiversity. I think that's something very significant. And also the uh, uh, the joint commitment of all the resources together, public and private funding together, uh, the the 200 billion that you mentioned. But I think most importantly is we'll be able to nail down the 20 billion dollar that was supposed to be committed by the developed nations to the developed right. countries, and on the rise to 30 billion dollars by 2030. I, I think that's something we all have been uh, struggling with uh, for the developed nations to come forward with a specific number. And I think uh, just very fact that number is on the table, something is really that we, we should applaud ourselves. 
So, you know, we have this uh, huge number of money on the table and uh, set forth in the agreement already. Um, and this is definitely a huge achievement. Um, however, how do you think this uh, funding mechanism are going to be are going to be like, uh, for instance, you know, who will really pay for the money um, and what are going to be, uh, what is the allocation going to be looking like? The thing is, uh, uh, I, I actually personally, I do have some doubts on, uh, you know, how exactly we'll be able to fulfill those, uh, those commitments. Uh, as we know that, uh, you know, from the, uh, the COP27 experience that developing nations made a commitment to the developing countries of hundred billion dollars mm -hmm from 20, 2009, and uh, their uh, implementation and the fulfillment of those commitments are far short from what they have committed uh, you know, many years ago. And I think uh, we should learn from the COP27, the climate process to figure out a way that not only to uh, nail them down for the commitment, but also nail them down for the actual implementation and the process that needs to go through uh you know to have uh those supported uh cemented mm. um so professor zhang from your perspective um what is your comment on the general outcome of this year's conference are you happy with them yeah i think the general outcome of cop 15 is very promising as i see <clears throat> actually since the world failed to meet the last set of packets the it packets in 2020 this time I see there are very clear indicators to measure the progress have been set to avoid the failures as seen in the IT package. And also the countries will monitor and report every five years or less or a large set of indicators related to the progress. And also I see that the global environment facilities have been requested to establish a special trust fund to support the right. implementation of the global biodiversity frameworks, I think it's also very, uh, makes me very interesting and promising to have reached this target in 2030. Right. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, um, I'm, I'm very interested in the supervis uh, su super supervisory mechanism of the fund usage. Um, uh, you know, first of all, is we need to um, get enough funding uh, to meet this number requirements. And secondly, how are we going to use those fundings? Um, do we have any idea at all? I think the money should, most of the money should go to the developing country. I think developing country has the most of the biodiversity in the world but they are normally uh, less developing and uh, with financial problems. So I think more support should go to them and help them to make the biological conservation and make the world better. Yeah, that's my idea. Right. Um, now, Zhou Fang, you have been in this uh, filming industry for a very long time, uh, especially uh, underwater filming. And the marine system is definitely one of um, the critical links of biosystem globally. So um, how endangered are we? Um, you know, this biodiversity concept to ordinary people, um, probably in our everyday life, we, it's still, it's still um, you know, a little bit distant to, uh, to our everyday life. Um, but from your experience, because you have seen the marine system, how endangered are we? Um, yes, as a, uh, just what uh, as what you say, I'm an underwater photographer and a documentary maker. So I focus more on the ocean conservation and the marine life biodiversity. And in doing, um, based on my experience, I think there's a lot of uh, threats or challenges we are facing by the oceans. Uh, one, of the, one of the most important is um, temperature. We know the racing temperature has caused the coral ble bleaching and death and the loss of habitats for many marine creatures, especially the coral reef fish. And also we, because of temperature, the habitat has been destroyed so for the polar bears, of, of course, for that. Mm -hmm. And another threat is uh, like uh, the trash and the pollution. Um, uh, for example, many creatures die because of they eat the garbage accidentally, and uh, the corals or turtles or die, will die because of they get entangled by the fishing nets. Uh, I remember uh, last year when I 
make a, a recording. I record a documentary in Hainan, in the coastal line, very close to the Sanya uh, area. And uh, I saw a turtle, the green turtle, was intact was entangled by a fish net. Uh, we all know that right. turtles need to get out of the water for air for breeze to get air every few minutes. But if they are entangled by the 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 net, the fishing net, it's in, it's impossible for them to survive. So right. that's yeah. So that's something that I see and I experience experienced. And so uh, visually, it's actually devastating when you see those pictures, see those scenarios. Yes, yes, uh, of course, yeah, yeah. Right, so economically, uh, um, Professor Zhang, if we um, you know, do not really pay enough attention to this biodiversity issue, economically, uh, what are we going to suffer, say, in the next decade or so? No, I think the uh, issue is this year, United Nations Environmental Program identified there's triple crisis that we're facing, right? Climate change, biodiversity loss, and also uh, you know, pollution prevention. And I think biodiversity is something that's very important and also is being found increasingly interlinked with the challenge of the others. I think our previous speaker just mentioned about, uh, you know, how the coral reef are suffering from uh, marine littering, like uh, right. the plastic and in yeah. some of the other, uh, the garbage is in the system. But also the other aspect that is getting increasing attention is also this linkage between biodiversity and climate change, particularly for adaptation. We know that uh, you know the, the globally we are on a path uh, to uh, hopefully uh, that be able to achieve uh, the, uh, the the two degree goal, uh, if not the one point five degree goal. Uh, but we really need to seriously think about uh, adaptation, and I think biodiversity. And the uh, the enrichness of the of the bio words is really something that can help us to uh, adapt, uh, you know, from uh, this impending, uh, you know, uh, consequence from uh, from climate change. And also, I want to mention that biodiversity is something also very closely linked with uh, agriculture, agriculture productivity, and also uh, you know agriculture uh, sort of a uh, uh, Diversity itself is something uh, also really important uh, for the uh, sustainability of the uh, the human being. So I think this progress we're making on the biodiversity front is a uh, is something bigger than itself uh, because a help will help uh, strongly solidify the natural basis that we are survival. We are our survival is is again uh, is depend on. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, Professor Zhang, what is your comment on this, um, especially on the direct economic impact, um, you know, that uh, if, if, if we continue to ignore this biodiversity, will bring to our human society? Yeah, I agree with Gian Yu that the losses of biodiversity have brought huge price to human beings and the global economy. I, I just take examples from agriculture part because I'm more researching agriculture. I think for agriculture, I think the biodiversity is very closely related to our crop yield. That means food security and also right. related to the climate change and also the soil degradation because loss of crop biodiversity, that means the soil will degrade and that means they will cause a lot of uh, environment problems and also the <clears throat> environmental multifunctions cannot maintain uh, right. due to the losses of biodiversity. And also I think as culture, there are several ways for biodiversity. For example, the genetic diversity. If we lose the genetic diversity, that means we cannot really have high quality of seed breeding. For right. example, we all know that Yuan Longping has the high birth rise and it caused our increasing rice production. But if we lose the genetic diversity, we cannot have that high birth rise. That means we cannot achieve fast selection of hybrid rice system. That means our food cannot uh, be guaranteed, especially the food security. And uh, at this time, the food security also means very more important than before because more and more people, but less and less arable land. So this biodiversity, I think is uh, very important from this 
active. Yeah. Right. Um, this this is actually very very critical. The food safety issue is becoming even more pronounced while we have yeah. regional conflict between Ukraine um, and Russia. So um, yeah. you know the critical um, issue coming out of this uh, conference is the role between developing and developed countries. Um, <laughs> We all understand um, China, for instance, we have huge number um, of those uh, um, uh, biodiversity species residing within the country. Uh, and we are all we are also responsible of a huge amount of those um, species. Um, so we paid our fair share. Uh, do we think that developed countries such as United States um, and Canada, um, are they paying their fair shares? Um, have they done enough? Jenny, what's your take on that? Oh. Well, uh, well, first we need to uh, recognize that the uh, very uh, stat that uh, the developing countries are in is because the over exploitation of their diversity and uh, exactly on the other side, the prosperity of the developed nations to a large extent is also, be, is also a result of uh, their exploitation of right. the uh, richness of the biodiversity in the developing countries. And because most of the developing countries are uh, so-called uh, in the South and uh, they suffer the most uh, from this uh, global uh, overall, uh, you know, sort of a, the old development pattern of, you know, basically you develop at the cost of the nature. So I think it's really important uh, as uh, a global, community ourselves, that uh, we should uh, really forge a united front uh, to uh, counter this issue together. But unfortunately, that uh, so far has not been the, uh, the fact. You know, for example, uh, many people probably don't, don't realize the United States is not a signatory to the UN Convention on Biodiversity. Exactly, right, yes. Uh, and, 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 uh, and many of the developed countries have been uh, avoiding of the historical responsibility under the uh, UN uh, uh, real con the sustainable development concept of common but differentiated responsibility. Although I need to point out uh, that uh, it very concept was not integrated uh, verbally into the uh, biodiversity convention. So right. that's why I, I said at the very beginning, I think to uh, establish some kind of a structure so that the developed nations can pay their fare, pay their share uh, for their historical responsibilities, uh, and also to support developing countries because they're suffering, because they are the owner of many of this uh, uh, biodiversity uh, devastated lands uh, to restore, to conserve, and also to uh, further uh, develop a sustainable pattern of uh, living with that together. I think that's something that's really important. That's why I think the outcome of this convention uh, that uh, uh, we, uh, I think the first time that get the developed nations to sign on uh, uh, a monetized commitment to help the developing countries and also gradually to move into a global uh, fund or uh, one form or the other together to tackle this issue together. I think that itself is really a significant progress. Right. Uh, Zhu Fang, from your experience uh, over the years, uh, the, filming, the filming of underwater marine mm -hmm. system globally, um, can you tell the difference between developed countries and developing countries in their effort to protect this biodiversity? Um, generally, I think the biodiversity in China and the other countries, they're uh, quite different. And they're, right. Uh, yeah, they're quite different. But I think to um, to uh, per, uh, to conserve the the to conserve the biodiversity is not only obligations for to to China, but also all the countries in the world. We should all have the obligations to work together to protect the biodiversities of the Earth. Uh, especially to to me, I think I I focus more on ocean and uh, uh, especially last two years when I recording in China, I recording a lot of the spotted seals, and uh, we all know we tracked the their migration every year. Those uh, animals they migrate from Russia, from even North and uh, uh, Korea, and on um, mm -hmm. November. 
of every year. From November, they migrate to China, Bohai Bay, every year. They, they come to China to get uh, breed, mating, or, and also nurse their young. So once the baby grow up, uh, all these body years were left to other area. So they, go, they come back next year, November, next year. So although even China, we have established the seal reserves, but the single national protection will not, uh, will be very ineffective without the mm -hmm. concerned protection of other countries around the world. So right. yeah, so every year when we see, we track those seals and we, we, we found very few seals come back to, the, to our area where we just worry about uh, where they are and their, what happens to them. So right. this is a very common situation in the ocean because lots of the marine creatures, they migrate long-term distance every year, especially the whales and many species of sharks. But as we know, the whale hunting is still legal in some uh, developed countries. So this right. is something really, 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 really uh, harmful to the ocean, but right. we cannot just do by ourselves, even by, by a developing country, by China. But this, this is a migration animals. It's not right. just ob obligations to China or to the developing country. It should be the obligation to all of the countries in the world. Right, so a coordinated global efforts um, needs to be paid um, in terms of um, um, uh, preserving this biodiversity. So Professor Zhang, from your perspective, um, you know, especially in the agriculture field, what are the challenges um, you know, ahead of us in terms of protecting this biodiversity? You mentioned uh, the gene protection, which is very important, and also the species protection, which is also very important. So um, have we done enough? So what are the key challenges ahead of us? Is it funding or efforts or, you know, our recognition? Okay. I think for the challenges, I think despite we continue to have efforts from the globally, the biodiversity around the world actually now is still decreasing and it's expected to worsen without enough actions. Right. I think, so I think the biggest challenges, I think have three aspects. First, I think it is very, important and necessary to continue expand publicity and evoke the public's great attention on issues related to biodiversity and climate change, especially in agriculture, because now more and more people to focus on the marine system and other system, but actually in agriculture itself, it's also losses of lots of biodiversity, but actually the attention is not enough, I think. I think the first important thing is we should call people's attention and from the public. And second, I think we need to strengthen relevant scientific research because as mm -hmm. we talked before, the, the scientific research is still not enough in this area. And we need to have a deeper understanding how we could maintain this or repair our ecosystem with biodiversity from the theory and for the for technologies. And also this is very important for help us to find a better future. And thirdly, I think we need to strengthen the application of technologies for biodiversity conservation and climate change mitigation to achieve these goals. In some cases, we already have some good technologies, but due to the right. limitation in financial uh, support or other things, we cannot really to let the technologies go down to the, uh, the land and to make really make sense. So I think this three one is uh, most important aspect. Right, and to some extent it is also correlated. So let's go back to this funding issue, uh, which mm -hmm. is also the third point that you just mentioned. Um, again, you know, at the very beginning, we mentioned that you know, by 2030, at least 200 billion US annually in domestic internationally biodiversity related fundings from all sources, uh, both public and private, um, as set forth in this year's framework agreement. So where are those money going to be coming from. As Jane, you earlier mentioned, um, you know, we, we had this lesson before um, that those fundings in the end might not come up together. So how should we avoid this? Uh, and, you know, from the design perspective, um, you know, what are, what is going to be um, the sort of uh, setup of the funding, uh, the mix of the funding from developed and developing countries, from your perspective? Uh, well, some people 
tell uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the outcome from the COP15 as that we are reaching the Paris moment of the of the biodiversity. Yes. And I think to a certain extent uh, that is right because I think people learn it the hard way in terms of you cannot just have you know everyone sign up for their commitment but not fulfilling them because they all become empty promises. Uh, so actually, if you look at the uh, the final outcome from the COP15, uh, there are totally 23 targets uh, that were included in the final papers. Right. And uh, though I have not examined them uh, you know, in very detail, but just browsing through gives me some degree of confidence that uh, you know people do learn from the climate process. For example, they establish a uh, transparency uh, mechanisms to make sure there's full disclosure. Uh, there's also a tracking mechanism in terms of you know, everybody's action and also uh, their commitment. But I think we, we, we do need some, I think, further enhanced mechanisms to, uh, uh, to facilitate more cooperation between the North and the South, and also make sure those cooperations are outcome oriented rather than uh, you know, uh, being affected by many of the other considerations, for example, you know, geopolitical or uh, you know, other uh, sort of concerns that just between uh, a bilateral relationship. So uh, I think it looks promising, uh, but uh, there's still, I think, many uh, details to be worked out so that we uh, do not repeat uh, the quote unquote, the, uh, the, uh, the mistake that were made uh, in the Paris uh, and pre-Paris process that uh, uh, you only have the promises, but you do not see the, uh, the action. So again, emphasize, uh, I think, transparency and uh, disclosure, uh, and also uh, some kind of tracking mechanisms are really crucial to make sure the promises are fulfilled. Um, you know, let me phrase this question this way. Do we have any penalty mechanism at all? Uh, if by 2030, all those fundings that we set forth in agreement cannot come up. So who's going to take responsibility? Well, so far, I have not seen the, uh, uh, what we need to, we need to recognize, you know, this is a UN process and it's a consensus base. So mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's really hard for you to have a uh, penalty uh, provision, so to speak, being right. written into the agreement. So uh, one thing I forget to mention, which I think is also a breakthrough in this final outcome, is the communication uh, part and also the uh, involvement of the public and also civil societies into this. Because at the end of the day, it is those people who are affected the most by the downfall of the loss of the biodiversity that should uphold the responsibility to serve as the watchdog and also to serve as the, uh, uh, the accountability uh, right. equipment to make sure uh, those promises are fulfilled. Right, uh, so Professor Zhang, from your perspective, do you think you know, um, the gap between um, you know, what you need and what you have in the agriculture side for biodiversity protection uh, can be fulfilled um, in the near future? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think this could be failed, but it's still, I mean, there's still a lot of effort. Uh, for instance, I think in agriculture, the, the biodiversity in agriculture, there's three mentions. I think one is genetic diversity, as I said before. There are also species diversity and also landscape diversity. I think genetic diversity, as recently, the people pay more attention to this one because it's closely related to our seeds and breeding. So also in our country, we uh, <clears throat> have a lot of attention on this seed production and also genetic uh, breeding. It's also very popular and we collected a lot of uh, genetic diversity seeds in our uh, lab. And this I think can uh, more or less to make sure that genetic diversity in the recent years can be more and more close to the, our uh, target. But for right. species diversity, I think it's at the moment at least it's difficult because uh, 
<clears throat> as we know that crop species diversity is also very important factor for our food security and human health. But as recently, uh, there are only three main green crops, wheat, rice, and maize provide more than 60% of the energy required by our human beings. And right. actually, we still need more and more uh, trees or elements from the other crops, like oil crops, soybean, peanuts, and also some other cereals, maybe small cereals like oats, millet. But actually, no, as, as the situation is, we most of the research focus and also the uh, production focus is focused on the three main crops, but not the rest crops. I think in later we should more pay attention to the other crops and how we can really to help the crop diversity uh, reach again in China. And also the finally, the final one is the landscape. In agriculture, the uh, improvement of farm landscape is also diversity is also very important, uh, especially for the overall biodiversity, including insects. So animals, microorganisms, and so on. So we, this can be better maintain the ecosystem multifunctions. But this is also very difficult actions. How we could really to uh, make assessment about the landscape diversity and also maintain and also improve that. I think it needs a lot of research and uh, also actions. Right, yeah. right, fair enough. Uh, so Zhu Fang, can you describe to us your ideal picture of a underwater um, you know, society uh, with enough biodiversity mm. and protection? Um, <laughs> that must be a beautiful moment. <laughs> I would like to imagine if the, uh, if the ocean with the biodiversity so in that condition, it will be like a, a clear, crystal clear water and they're full, full of the coral reefs and they're healthy corals, like a forest, like a garden. So it would be colorful world. So I would like, I would imagine that in the future, one day I would see that. Uh, although I know it, it needs a big effort to, it's a long-term goal for the human, but I think that's also the, the 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 end of the goal we should we should find out finally so it that's what i the one of the reason why i make a underwater to china why i make the documentary because i i, I know we are on the way to the long-term girl but we know the girl so we should have the we should let most of the people have the same uh, connection and their awareness as what we understand. So that's also very important to enhance the people's normal people's awareness of how to uh, conserve the the environment, the ocean world, and also to create the same goal with the with with all of us to make sure the ocean will the, the marine creatures will be biodiversity and. Uh, and that's that's one one of my big goal in the future. <laughs> right, great. Um, thank you so much, um, gentlemen, and also uh, Zhou Fang for your insights on this biodiversity uh, topic. It is a big topic, and what as what Zhou Fang just mentioned, um, it is definitely a very long term goal uh, that needs a lot of coordinated effort globally for us to reach the final destination. While during the process, hopefully, every one of us um, should focus on this long-term goal uh, and instead of uh, sacrificing uh, with short-term profits. So I think, you know, uh, sacrifice our long-term goals with short-term profits. Um, so I think this is a very, very critical mission uh, that deserves everyone's effort. So thank you so much. Um, let's reconvene again when we see the development of this biodiversity protection globally. And hopefully China can still lead the process and make this whole world better. Thank you so much. Thank you, and uh, it's Thank my you. pleasure. Bye-bye.